what a transitional wrestling champion is. Of course you do, you're a long-term nerd wrestling fan like me, and years ago you learned it's when a wrestling company takes a wrestler and says, oh, we're gonna make you the champion, but only for around about 48 hours, because we actually want to get it on this other person, but we need to find a way to connect the dots. This has happened time and time again, so it's time to rank them all, from the very, very worst to the very, very best when it comes to the WWE title. Everybody sit down. My name's Simon Miller. Please give us a subscribe. Let's go. Number 17, Alberto Del Rio. Do you remember the Summer of Punk? Of course you do. People keep talking about it, even though it was 10 years ago. And it got really confusing at SummerSlam because Kevin Nash turned up and nobody really knew why. The arrival of Diesel, though, did kind of spark this into motion because after he had jackknifed Powerbomb CM Punk, Alberto Del Rio walked down the ramp. He cashed in his Money in the Bank briefcase and he became WWE Champion. Fans were devastated for obvious reasons, but as it turned out, he was a transitional champion because we got to Survivor Series, the belt went back onto CM Punk, and then he held it for a hell of a long time. So we took it off Punk to give it back to Punk, but that's probably why he comes in at number 17. Number 16, Goldberg. One day in early 2020, Vince McMahon woke up and went, wait a minute, wait a minute, I would rather have Goldberg versus Roman Reigns at WrestleMania 36 so he made it so. It did mean that Goldberg had to run through the Fiend in order to win the Universal Championship, and we all know how we feel about that. And then when he was going to take on the big dog at the show of shows, the pandemic hit, Roman Reigns rightfully went home to protect his family, and then it was Braun Strowman versus Goldberg, and Braun Strowman won, and he became the champion, and I think we can all raise our hands and say, this was one of the weirdest things that's ever damn happened. Also, none of it helped because Bill was only designed to hold on to that championship for around about seven seconds. But again, he was meant to be like a carrier pigeon to get it from Bray Wyatt onto Roman Reigns. But as it turned out, it went on the monster among men instead. Number 15, Randy Orton. We rushed this in 2004 because nobody was ready to cheer Randy Orton as a babyface. One of the main reasons that WWE did it is that at the time, the youngest ever WWE champion was Brock Lesnar and the beast had walked out of the company. So we had to change the record books. It was so ridiculous though, because before you could even say legend killer, Randy Orton had dropped the title to Triple H. And this didn't help Randy at all. Like he had to almost rebuild himself from within and go back to being a heel. But yeah, we did it for the sake of doing it. And that was Randy Orton's first ever championship reign. And it was transitional. Number 14, Sergeant Slaughter. While many thought that we were going to redo Hulk Hogan versus the Ultimate Warrior at WrestleMania 7 in 1991, the WWF decided, well, we don't want to do another babyface versus babyface match. So instead, Sergeant Slaughter became the guy after he had defeated the Ultimate Warrior under dubious circumstances. Sarge would then turn his back on America and defect to Iraq. And this was going on at the height of the Gulf War. And of course, the story, and I suppose match between himself and Hulk Hogan, was so bad that nobody wanted to buy a ticket and nobody wanted to buy it on pay-per-view. And of course, Hogan won it back when we got to the big showdown and Slaughter barely held it for a minute. Number 13, Ric Flair. I always forget that Ric Flair won the WWF title twice because when I ever think about him winning a championship in World Wrestling Federation, it is of course when he won the 1992 Royal Rumble, it is so damn good. And the other reason is while round one was a home run, round two wasn't all that memorable. Because after beating up the macho man Randy Savage alongside Mr. Perfect, Ric Flair was able to reobtain his goal from the man he had lost it to at the previous WrestleMania. This was September the 1st though, and only six weeks later on October the 12th, he then lost it to Bret the Hitman Hart. And it was a great moment for the Hitman because it was his first world title reign and it happened in Canada, but it was also so random, it just happened on a house show, which meant we used Ric Flair the Nature Boy as a transitional champion. Number 12, Mankind. This victory is one of those where fans started to realize, wait a minute, I'm seeing behind the scenes here and I'm starting to understand the tricks. Because after surprising everybody and winning the WWF title at SummerSlam 1999, Mankind then lost it 24 hours later on Raw. A lot of people weren't happy about this and they wanted to know the reason. Well, I know the reason. 
and lots of other people do as well. And it is because Stone Cold Steve Austin decided he didn't think Triple H was ready to be the big guy on top, so said, no, I'm not losing the belt to him. So Mankind was put in that match. He pinned Steve Austin and then, yes, brought it to Monday nights where the game finally got his. And given that the literal meaning of the word transition is the process of changing from one state to another, well, we just summed up everything that happened with Mick Foley. Number 11, Triple H. We all remember Triple H's odd main event with Randy Orton at WrestleMania 25, but we all forget about is that it got even odder still because one month later, four weeks following the fact, Randy Orton did win the WWE title in a very bizarre match that also featured Legacy. Furthermore, Trips had only won the thing back at No Way Out 2006 in February, meaning he only held a world championship for two months. I mean, it begs the question why we didn't just have him lose at WrestleMania. It would have been a much bigger kapow to the end of that event. But yes, he won it off edge there. He then carried it through eight weeks and he just gave it to Randy Orton. Number 10, Bret Hart. Much in the same way when he won it for the first time, Bret Hart also had a very short reign after he had finally got the title back at the Final Four pay-per-view in 1997. The belt had been vacant after Stone Cold Steve Austin had ruined the Royal Rumble. He was so mad that Bret Hart had won this thing. He interfered the next night on Raw when the Hitman was taken on Psycho Sid. And if you can believe it because of that, Psycho Sid won. He was now the man which he definitely would have been happy with, but you can't be too upset with this one because it led to that match at WrestleMania 13, which many individuals, me include, regard as one of the best WWE matches ever. Number nine, Stan Stasiak. Father of Sean, also known as Meat, Stan Stasiak served a real important purpose when he was a transitional champion, and now everybody has just forgotten about it. He spent nine days with the belt, which was unthinkable at the time, because the man before him, Pedro Morales, had held it for over 1,000. But still, Vince McMahon Sr. had decided he wanted to re-coronate Bruno Sammartino and he wasn't gonna have a good guy beat a good guy. So Stan Stasiak was the man to hold on to it for just a little bit and then drop it to Bruno when the time was right. Or in this case, like I say, nine days. Number eight, Seth Rollins. A true coming together of the Shield, Money in the Bank 2016 saw every single member as the WWE Champion. I mean, Roman Reigns went in as the WWE Champion. Seth Rollins then beat him to become the WWE Champion. And then Dean Ambrose cashed in his Money in the Bank briefcase to also become WWE Champion. It did mean, however, that Rollins had to suffer a nine second title reign. And to this day, I don't know why Roman didn't just win and then Dean Ambrose cashed in on him. I mean, Reigns had been suspended this period for going against the wellness policy. But yeah, I don't have an answer. I suppose this way was more fun. Number seven, Buddy Rogers. When Vince McMahon Sr. split from the NWA, he had some serious decisions to make when it came to the WWWF champion. He needed to put it on somebody that had credibility, and who better than Buddy Rogers? The issue was that his headline attraction days were long behind him, but that wasn't the point. The reason we were gonna give it to Rogers is because whoever was going to beat him could become a brand new star, because they'd be able to walk around going, hey, I just beat Buddy Rogers. It's why 22 days after that victory, it was Bruno Sammartino who fit into this role, and we all know what happens next. He holds it for like 72 years. Number six, Bob Backlund. I still can't believe Bob Backlund became the champion in the WWF in 1994, but he did have a submission patch with Bret the Hitman Hart of the Survivor Series, and he applied the crossface chicken win, everything I said actually came true. The idea, however, was that Vince McMahon wanted to make Diesel his brand new champion, but he didn't want to do Diesel and Bret Hart until the Royal Rumble in 1995, so he needed a patsy or a transitional champion, and he just picked Bob Backlund. Therefore, mere days after this shock, Diesel walked into a Madison Square Garden house show, he jackknifed Bob, pinned him, and actually started what would turn out to be a very long championship reign. Number five, The Miz. I don't even know if Miz was meant to be a transitional champion after he cashed in his money in the bank on Drew McIntyre at the Elimination Chamber in 2021. But now looking back, I guess that's what his role was. And this was done so we could get the title on Bobby Lashley instead, which we duly did two weeks later. But then at WrestleMania, Drew McIntyre still lost to Bobby Lashley. So why didn't The Miz hold it till then? And then Bob could have beaten him anyway. And then also you could have done Miz versus Bob, the battle of the three letter names. 
This is why I don't write creative. Number four, the Iron Sheik. Arguably the most famous transitional champion in WWE, WWF history. The Iron Sheik beat Bob Backlund to become the champion just so he could lose it to Hulk Hogan to spark off Hulkamania which really did change the wrestling business. There's always been rumors that Sheiky Baby was even offered money not to do this and even hurt Hulk Hogan, but the Sheik is all about business. He did what he had to do, and really sowed his own historical part in what would be a huge boom for the industry. Number three, Ivan Koloff. If we are to believe the stories, Madison Square Garden went so quiet when Ivan Koloff defeated Bruno Sammartino after Bruno had held the WWWWF title for over 3,000 days, that if you had dropped a pin, you would have heard it drop. So the shock was real, but deep down we should have known that there was a plan in place, which was true. Vince McMahon had decided he needed a new top babyface, but he wasn't going to have a babyface beat Bruno Sammartino, because whoever beat Bruno Sammartino would instantly be a heel. So after 21 days, Koloff dropped it to Pedro Morales, and we've already talked about it in this video, he held it for 1,000 days, new star made. Number two, Andre the Giant. For some reason, WWE decided to end Hulk Hogan's championship reign just so they could do a tournament at WrestleMania 4. The belt had been held up after Andre the Giant had won it and then just given it to Ted DiBiase because the million dollar man had given the Giant a bunch of money. So I guess Andre liked cash. The actual plan behind this, however, does tie into things we've already talked about. Because WWF had decided, well, we should make Macho Man Randy Savage the champion, but we don't want to do a Hulk versus Macho Man program just yet, so we'll do all of this. Savage can win at WrestleMania 4, then we can do the Mega Powers imploding, they can fight at WrestleMania 5, and this is still so good, I'm just gonna stand here and give them a round of applause, which is a really weird thing to do. Number one, The Rock. Another one that slips our minds because what it was leading to, in 2001, The Rock was a transitional champion. I mean, he only won the WWE title from Kurt Angle at No Way Out, and then six weeks later was fighting Stone Cold Steve Austin at WrestleMania 17, where, of course, he dropped it and was no longer the champ. The reason it worked so well, though, is because he was The Rock. No one cared if he did have a title. Nobody cared if he didn't have a title. He was a made man. He was a superstar. And everybody behind the scenes knew that, so they used him for all that he was worth. It's a nice way to wrap up this video, too, because it goes to show sometimes even being a transitional champion isn't a death nail. It all depends on how you've been used before and how you're used afterwards. Know of any other transitional champions that deserve to be ranked? Make sure you let us know in the comments below. And then don't forget to like the video, share the video, and subscribe. Then head over to whatculture.com where you can read articles like this with your eyes. Make sure you give us a follow on social media and there's videos around my head. Give one of them a click. My name is Simon for What Culture. Thank you for joining me as always. And maybe one day I'll be a transitional champion. I'd be perfectly fine with it.